Chief of Engineering at Next Jump Incorporated. I think most of you have heard our CEO speak, Charlie Kim, who's part of, uh, part of the conference this week, so I'm glad to be here today. Uh, the way I approach this, so we've been in business since 1994. I've been there for most of that. Uh, and we've done a lot of outsourcing and I made a lot of mistakes and done something right. So I thought I'd just share with you the three stories. Uh, two of them were mistakes that basically cost a million dollars, possibly more. Uh, and one of them, we made uh, the, the right choice. So I think uh, it's instructive to share this stuff. A little bit, you probably already know about NextJump, I assume you do, but what we do as a, as a business is uh, we provide an e-commerce platform to Fortune 1000 companies. So on one side, we have employees buying, and those Fortune 1000 employees make up most of the consumer spend in the United States, so that's cool. The other cool part is these Fortune 1000 companies spend most of the corporate spend in the US. So you add that together, that's basically so our job is to get as much of that going through our platform as possible. Uh, we're very engineering driven. We have about uh, 200, 200 uh, total employees, most of which are, are engineers. This is a, kind of a timeline slide. I took out another presentation, but I thought it was instructive in that it, it, it shows uh, some important events that happened uh, in our company's life and, and in mine. So Charlie uh, started the company in 1994. Um, very significant event happened in 2002, we call it the, the winter, the Q1 of 2001, the dark winter of uh, e-commerce. Everything blew up, 9-11, all this stuff. We went down to four employees, so myself, Charlie, and, and two others. So at that point, no money, debts up the wazoo, and the journey from 2002 to now is the journey from there to 200 employees and, and a profitable business. Um, we did a lot of outsourcing, especially in this period here. Before 2006, in 2006 we decided we're gonna be a full-on hardcore engineering company. We're gonna make most of our employees engineers. We're gonna figure out how to recruit, retain, and build an awesome engineering shop. Before that, we tried to do the opposite, which is basically outsourcing the whole kit and caboodle, uh, and, and I learned a lot about that, which I'll, I'll tell you about later. Further, when you hire lots of engineers very quickly, so we hired about 100 people within a year, uh, there's a lot to be learned from there that's not uh, the topic of this presentation, but I'm happy to, to uh, discuss the bumps and bruises learned The, uh, so where I wanted to begin, I, I wrote this a, a few days ago, it's kind of the, the digestion of, of what I've learned from, from these three stories, which is that if you want to build to last, you need to plan on customizing everything, just about everything that you're doing eventually, though of course, in reality, um, you, know, you, can, you can only do right now. Actually, one thing I, I should have said uh, prior to this whole thing is that I got some great <coughs> advice from uh, a founder of a company out in Chicago, and he said whenever he gives advice, he likes to give stories and anecdotes and his experiences, but then caveat it with that, with this, that I don't know exactly where you guys are in your business, you know, how far along you are, how you're not. So caveat and tour uh, in terms of how you apply what I'm saying to, to your own business. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you my experiences, uh, but whether to how to implement that, uh, happy to help one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, of course, make sure we, we do that wisely. But one point is that if you're gonna build the last, make sure you ultimately plan and customize everything even though you can't uh, do it all at once. But if you're building to sell, you probably should outsource, uh, outsource everything. But another way to say that is that the decision, I think, is, is what to insource and what to, what to outsource. Uh, and the advice that I got very early on was basically outsource everything. Outsource development, outsource the mobile app, outsource customer service, outsource, 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 have a very kind of small core team. Um, in retrospect, I wish the advice that I'm giving you here is the advice I wish I'd gotten at that time, which was, that insource what you really care about, even if it hurts. Uh, so I'll show you one instance where we put a lot of effort into things that we didn't probably should have, or, or conventional conventional wisdom was was to outsource. Um, so I'll share that in a minute. So the first story is this: uh, back in around 2003, 2004. This was uh, imagine that my face is right there and I'm looking at the map, and I'm figuring out where in the world can I get the cheapest possible engineers. I need a lot of engineers, and I found company in China, and I was able to basically recruit 50 engineers very quickly in China. And I had this vision in my head that here in New York City, we have this core group of people, brought to my colleagues here, we are smart guys, we're creative, and we're going to have this you know, creative nexus here in New York, we're going to spec up everything, figure out what to do, send it to China overnight, come back in the next, the next morning, and it's all done. That was my, that was my vision. Um, what happened? It didn't, it didn't <laughs> quite work out, uh, it didn't quite work out that way. The, um, what, 
we learned from that was that there was an element of polish and magic in creating really great web products. We have, we have web products. And the details in doing that from even very minor things like the font selection, the way things are phrased, the details of, of the UX, it was very, very hard to convey that to other people without actually having physical presence, without actually being with them. And so it created this, um, we realized they were building stuff. It was useful, it worked in everything. Uh, but it wasn't the level of quality, didn't have the polish, didn't have like the world beating aspect that we wanted. So then we started this pattern where we started uh, giving them more back end projects. We had all these admin systems that we had to build. So we'll have them do that, that'll be cool. We'll have them build, build the admin. Then we ended up over the course of a year with really two things happening. We had one team, remote team, that was going pretty slow. I'd say they were going at like 20 miles an hour. Parallel to that, we built out this internal team here in New York and then Boston that was going like 150 miles an hour. And there was such uh, discord between these two teams that all sorts of bad things were happening. The, um, the team in New York was running so quickly that they were asking for back-end services that were being developed in China and they were ready like weeks after the, weeks after we had already decided that that service was no longer available or some fundamental change <coughs> had, to be, uh, you know, had to be made to it. And so we had this very kind of disjointed, ununified team. Ultimately we decided that it, in our experience it just didn't work having A lot of people have made it work, so uh, I'm just saying from, from our experience, I, I, wasn't able, I wasn't able to do that. And really what it came down to for me um, was this, that the awesomeness of the product was a function of the awesomeness of the people. It didn't matter how passionate I was, it didn't <coughs> matter how good I was at writing specs, it didn't even matter uh, if they were near or far. What came out of that was this idea that the quality of the people that we have, especially with our user experience and our, 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 our core engineers, they drove everything because they can add that level, that X factor, that 10X factor that takes things from just functional to being truly, truly world-beating, uh, truly world-beating product. That was my, my, my first story about uh, outsourcing to, uh, to China. And the, the outcome of that was essentially we decided that we would in fact build an entirely US-based, uh, US and now UK-based uh, engineering force. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, we'll have it. The second story was uh, was successful, which is uh, a product we call Mercury, which is our, our our email engine. So this was over I guess five years ago now. Uh, Lucia was intimately involved. Uh, she built she built this product. So our we're we're a marketing uh, or e-commerce business. So marketing is a big part of what we do. And email is super important. So everyone kind of poo-poo's email, but in fact it drives the vast majority of e-commerce sales are are email. And in our business, it's really important that we do it well. So we work with companies. We're emailing people at their workplace, so at like Bank of America, at their at their desktop. And so we take that privilege super super seriously. It has to be dead on right. It has to be uh, very customized. And the level of customization that we would have to do, that we have to do to make our our marketing work, is super super high. It's the layouts change by person and by company. The content changes uh, by person and by by company. And so we talked to a bunch of vendors. And I got a, uh, at the time I got the, the, some great advice, which is, uh, this is from someone who's selling the software, but um, that three things matter when you're, when you're picking out a, a, a software package. One is customization, what, so how can you customize your needs? One's integration, so how do you pull it into your existing system? And the other is reporting and, and analytics, more, more like a side note. But the big, I, something I learned here, at least in our business, is, is that companies will pay a lot more for if you have two products, they're exactly the same, except the reporting and analytics on one is awesome and the other is just average, they'll pay a lot more, a huge premium for that, the one that has the one that has the analytics. Especially if it's driven, if those analytics are driven towards the C-suite. We need a lot of tools, a lot of prepackaged software. We have tools for the operators, so analytics for the operators, but they don't necessarily have analytics for the people that are writing the checks, the CEO, the CFO, or the, the, head, of, the head of marketing. So, so a little bit of it. But we went over and um, we looked at all different vendors. So email marketing is one of the things that is a, is a commodity. So there's you know, strong mail, Lyris at one point, so all these different companies that offer it. But for us, it is important. It's the most important piece of our business in terms of marketing. It's what drives people to our site. It's what allows us to deliver value to merchants and, and, and uh, you know, ultimately uh, create sales. 
super, super important. The easy thing to do, in fact, all the advice we got was to, it's a commodity, why outsource, or why bother building it yourself? Just outsource it. The, I guess, key advice I got at the time was from a guy, Joshua Munoz, so he was the CTO of Morgan Stanley, then became the founding CTO of Eater and other things. But he said, if I'm not taking a chance, then basically I'm not doing my job. Uh, we decided, okay, we're going to take it. We're going to take it in house. But the, the key thing that we did is that these days, like things aren't all or nothing. You don't build systems from, from the ground up. We based it on on, on an open source, uh, on, on an open source stack. So like Postfix, uh, in, in particular, is kind of a, a baseline SMTP, SMTP engine that allows us to do what we're doing. The um, but this put us in a position today, where where this is strategically this application is one of our core assets. Uh, for kind of uh, validation sake, last year we went out and started asking some vendors like Cheetah Mail or these other large vendors that do uh, kind of mass mass uh, emailing, uh, how much it would cost. It would cost us around half a million dollars a year to do what we're doing uh, ourselves right now. Um, one of the vendors was even charging us, wanted to charge uh, half, almost half a million dollars, $250,000. <coughs> so a lot of companies, and that's what these very large kind of MX style or, or, or uh, very large Fortune Fortune 100 companies are, are paying for these kind of services. But not only is it basically free for us now, uh, we're able to do very very sophisticated things. Very uh, the connection between our data mining systems and our kind of email site system is super strong now in a way that simply wouldn't have happened if we were taking the easy way out uh, and simply you know paid for a package. So that was a, a successful story. The, the last story here is about, is about customer service. Uh, and it's really a, a story about speed. And then that segue into a that kind of related topic. Uh, but in our business, we, um, the way our business operates, for the, for the first many years of our business, we were um, basically a referral site. You'd come to our site, and you'd see that because you are an employee of, of one of our member firms, we'd link you off, and you'd go do a transaction at Saks or a transaction at American Airlines, but it wouldn't occur on our site. And because of that, the vast majority of customer service that we had was pretty straightforward, like login questions. You know, how do I get in? Why don't I have access? That kind of thing. Pretty straightforward to deal with. Uh, and we built up a system that dealt, uh, dealt with that. It was very, um, we had people in Canada, very nice people in Canada. We had nice people in Nicaragua. They would answer these very basic questions. We were able to scale, scale that. Um, but then something happened, which was, uh, a big change in our product beginning several years ago, where now the transactions take place on our platform. So we have API integrations with a, a, bunch, of, a bunch of merchants, so it's more like an Amazon platform. <coughs> that is what we're building out. So that when you come to our site, if you're an employee of one of these big companies, or a little company, you should all do it, um, you buy from us directly, and then through API connections in the background, uh, we send the order to either Priceline for travel, or Expedia, or or Best Buy, and they actually do the fulfillment. Uh, but that created a very different consumer experience for us. And consumers suddenly, if they're buying, they're paying us money, we have their credit card, all of a sudden they have really big customer service questions and they want an answer now. And we reacted to that too, too slowly. And part of the, the, by too slowly, I mean, I should have recognized sooner it was much more important and that we need to have that capability, that is an in-sourcing capability that we need to have. We need to be awesome at that. And I can't outsource the responsibility for that to somebody else. I didn't react fast enough to do that. And part of why it was too slow was that I had outsourced it, so all that intrinsic knowledge about how to do customer service really well, how to set up the system, how to deal with uh, deal with problems and escalations, we didn't have, because we had basically taken the whole kit and caboodle and, and given, it to, given it to somebody else. I'm gonna use this to, uh, to segue into, uh, into a related topic, which is that in all of these instances, in, in terms of how I operate the business now, now me and the other, other senior leaders think about things, uh, we have this concept of, of our why. I'm not sure if Charlie went over that with, uh, with you guys before, but I'll briefly refresh if, if you didn't. Um, and there's no aspect of our business that we don't bend towards our unique DNA. And this directly ties into a decision to outsource or not. So let me explain the concept. So this is from uh, a guy named Simon Sinek, so he's a real friend of the company and uh, been working with us for, for a few years now. But his, uh, he has a TED Talk, kind of the, becoming the number one TED Talk, so it's uh, 
find the list. But his whole um, thesis is this. He went and looked at a bunch of very successful companies like Apple that's considered you know, highly innovative, highly successful, that has consumers that are just to die for. They just will, they will literally die for Apple. They, they are so into it. So how does that company differ from a company that doesn't generate that kind of consumer enthusiasm? Like what's, what's the difference? And this is, this is the answer. That in the typical model, a company is, very, is kind of, in, kind of um, backward engineered. On the outside of the circle here, they have their kind of results, what they build. So I build some product. And then they say, okay, we're going to make some value so everyone kind of, almost like a means of control. We're going to have these corporate values that people act in a certain way. And then ultimately kind of backhead them uh, some kind of vision. But it creates this kind of a discord between um, what a company is perceived to be doing and what they believe. Because at the end of the day, the whole thing just down to make money. Like at the end of the day, consumer sees it. They know that this company that I'm dealing with just wants to make money. As opposed to a company that is aligned to their, to their why, there's an authenticity in that company that generates real consumer interest and employee interest. Like all, all participants in the, in the company are, are uh, excited by it. And it starts with this, the why. So what is the, what is the DNA? What is the genesis of the company? That translates into kind of their mode of operating, their kind of internal processes, and ultimately it, it translates in, into the what. So the, the example that Simon uses in his, in his TED talk is what defines Apple. What defines Apple, it's no one, they're not defined by having been built on an iPod or, or, or a computer. They didn't come up with these different products and say, okay, that kind of, there's some theme there and that's what we're about. It started with a, kind of a unique DNA that's really in many cases probably all cases, driven by the founders. Uh, in the case of Steve Jobs, like he does have this mishmash of art and science coming together, of music and fonts. All these things are at the center of that circle, and then all this other stuff is just a manifestation of what drives that company and that, those founders and what makes, them, what makes them really passionate. In our case, we spent uh, a large part of the last two years articulating our why. One uh, tweet from, from Charlie saying that motivation is touching people's most powerful place, their sense of purpose, the source of energy and fight, the most nuclear part of the human blood. We've seen a transformation in our company as we articulated our why and integrated it into every decision that we make, including outsourcing. In fact, outsourcing is kind of make some, some choices that we would have made in the past different now. This is, how, this is uh, so it's specific to our company. Obviously, every company has a, has a different team name. But it's better me plus you equals us. So we consider this our template for how we run a company. In fact, we are producing a lot of actually products around this that we're making freely available to, to the whole world because we think it's, as part of our why, it's more than just a business. It's more than just making money. It's our contribution to the world. We think companies should run this way. And the bottom line is that we are all about Improving ourselves, so if you work at our company, you guys can attest, we're very into self-development. Each one of us stressing ourselves, becoming better, getting new skills, putting ourselves into uncomfortable situations and, and becoming better better people, better technically, but also, uh, but also better leaders. But for the purpose of improving other people, that's the, the better you part. Teaching, even like what I'm doing right now. Probably a few years ago, I'm not sure I would have uh, allotted the time to come and you know, spend time in talking with people. Now that's intrinsic to our culture. We want to spend uh, our energy taking what we've learned, taking our experiences, and helping helping other people uh, improve their own lives. And this um, <coughs> fundamentally transforms the way that we think about a lot of things. So going back to customer service, for example, uh, we no longer outsource any of it. It's all it's all in house in terms of the number of all of our reps are people that actually speak with customers are are internally. But for us, that wasn't, that wasn't enough. That we want to provide this extraordinary level of our customer service. So on one hand, we have outsourced the backbone technology. So we use Zendesk, uh, kind of a default core, core technology. But with the energy saved by doing that, we built what we call bigger hearts. So in our company now, every single one of our employees now certified to answer customer service questions. We have a tool that we built. We allow people, and they have a stream of customer service uh, inquiry. I hope everyone, we want everyone to do at least two a day. You guys did, did, did two a day. 
Uh, but the idea is that our customers' happiness in building products that actually make their lives better is the, is the most important thing. And the absolute most critical part of, of guiding us should be what our customers are saying. And we have this one group on the side that's dealing with all the customer issues and another group that's building it, that's not the best situation. So how do we actually have the two meet? So our engineers are actually hearing from and answering our, our customers. So we created this, this bigger heart product. Um, there's a list here of every employee in our, in our company. And they have what we call a bigger hearts rating. So it's an empathy rating. So it's a calculation that we come up with based on uh, how many inquiries they, uh, they respond to. Um, other employees can go in and rate those inquiries, like that was a really good one, or kind of you, you missed the boat, you were sort of a jerk to the customer. Uh, the customers themselves are responding back with kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down, how do they like the, uh, how do they like the response. The idea is by measuring this, we're, we're now becoming more empathetic and more um, attuned to our customers. And the other cool thing is that the number of bugs and the product enhancements that we're making are accelerating and becoming better because every employee is now so directly involved with our customers. And another thing that we did was add this gamification layer to it. Uh, so everyone in the company is grouped into a team. So we have one of these five teams. Um, so every week there's a, in fact there's a prize or points associated with, with winning this. But the idea is to, uh, as part of the team, you don't want to be the team that's the least empathetic team. That's the team that's giving our customers the worst experience. Um, so that's having a big effect too. This is hammer home the point to, to outsourcing. The idea here is that uh, I don't think things are black and white, that at some point the, um, the easy thing to do is to simply outsource the whole thing. But I think the, the difficult, the, the hard choice is that how do you actually take these systems, use the best of what's out there, but really when you decide what's really, really important to you, how do you customize that and make it your own? How many employees do you have? About 200. Knock in IT. So this is a, this is an area where if I was starting a business today, I would definitely you know, use the cloud uh, to set to set things up. Um, back when we had four, to, to, to show you uh, the, the difference in our business now versus versus uh, when, when there were only four of us. When there are only four of us, the infrastructure. So we have a, a cage at a at a, um, at a co-location facility. We have a 24-hour knock up in Boston. So people always monitor the system, make sure it's make sure it's working. Back in uh, 19, uh, I guess in 2002, when there were, there were just four of us, the entire system was 20 computers. We had a, a bunk bed, and there was a, on, with only one, the loft bed was there. On the floor, the layer below it, there was uh, two two by fours with 20 machines basically buckling them there. That was the entire company, was uh, basically <laughs> in my, uh, my best friend's apartment, uh, the DSL connection company. The, um, so we've come a, a long way since then. But the idea, we have toyed with this idea, especially the past few years, about what is, is there a strategic advantage in actually running our own infrastructure? So this is a big cost and a big expense for us because you can just hire people to manage all this stuff. You, you don't need to do it. Um, you don't need to deal with the DNS. You don't need to deal with the routing optimizations. You don't need to deal with um, security aspects of this. You don't need to deal with, with any of this. You, you could outsource it, but why do it? So there's some, in my opinion, some obvious technical advantages you really can't control things uh, at, a, at a finer level. Um, but the most, uh, two things. One is that the ability of our organization to teach other engineers how to be better engineers is so much better because we have chosen to do this. A big part of uh, this web engineering, uh, it's important to, a lot of the young guys are very focused on, on, on the front end. Of course, that's a product that's user driven. Like that's most important. But there's an aspect of, of sysops of where the front end meets the back end and creating really efficient systems. That's very very difficult to learn. And the fact that we run the system from soup to nuts, from front end all the way through all aspects of the back end down through down through the actual routing, uh, allows us to teach our engineers things that would be very difficult to teach at, at other companies. That said, it also allows us to do things. Like, like this uh, code for a cause. So code for a cause is a program that we have where every engineer in our company can spend two weeks, so two, follow, two solid weeks, they leave our business and work for a charity, build something soup to nuts. When I say soup to nuts, I mean from a server layer all the way up to, to, the, working, to the working application. So we have a website, code for a cause, uh, which is offnextstep.com. 
uh, you can see all, all the different things that we've done. This is a program uh, here that we, we just finished uh, for IMP, the mentorship program uh, run in Baltimore. Right? Uh, so we help uh, really at-risk kids uh, succeed. And we built for them uh, a web application and a mobile application from the ground, from the ground up. And that's totally in our, our DNA. We're using the technology and the skills that we have, not only on our own product, but using it to help other organizations that we feel kind of aligned with. Um, so on one hand, it's directly helping them. On the other hand, the benefits in both skill development and recruitment and retention for our own employees has been absolutely massive. Uh, to go back to that, the, the why circle again, all of this stuff is everything that we do, from engineering, from customer service, finance, legal, it all aligns to this why. I mean, why is just another word for culture. It all aligns to our culture. They're all signals to people that meet us about what we're about. If you set things up the wrong way, you're sending off all the signals of, we're about money, we're about short term, we're not about um, you know, creating Well, In our case, we're about better, the better me plus better you equals uh, Better up. And I do think that is distinctive when if companies are clear about their why. In all different ways, they're signaling they're about something greater than themselves or they're just about, about the short term. And the cool thing is that this has actually led to more business from us. The fact that it's not just the product that's trying to be very customer centric, but in fact, it's the engineering team, it's customer service, it's finance in the way that they're creating reports for our clients. Uh, it's legal in terms of uh, kind of the help that we've given to partners and clients to, uh, to improve their own legal uh, aspects. All this stuff, every aspect of our business aligns behind the, the, same, the same motivation. This was a quote that came in uh, about, about a week ago from one of our clients. It says, next job is very much an entrepreneurial business which is very focused on giving back to its community and embracing employee well-being. And it's also very much in a Google mindset in trying to be creative and injecting fun into, into what it does. The cool part for this, it's, um, I'm very sensitive to what clients are saying about us, obviously, but the cool part of this is that two years ago, this would not have been written. It would have been about this last, uh, probably the last bit maybe would have been written. But it it would have been something like, they're about creating employee purchase programs. They're about creating e-commerce platforms. It would have been about the product. But because of all the decisions that we're making, including the outsourcing decisions, we're giving off the signals about what we're really about, which what we're really about is giving back to our community and embracing employee well-being, not only our own, but also but also our, our clients' employees. So this is just kind of a, a, a restatement that, from those three stories and what we've experienced, that building to last, if that's the plan, you have to plan on ultimately customizing just about everything that you're doing. Of course, with this caveat that we have constraints and you kind of have to pick and choose your, your battles for people. So that's kind of the, uh, the broad stroke type stuff. I did spend uh, some time yesterday evening with my two top guys and we, we went through every purchasing decision that we've made in the past uh, the past few years and uh, tried to come up with our, our top 10 list of just tactical tactical uh, helping points. Uh, I'll read the first three. I think the rest, do people get a copy of this presentation? They'll get it tomorrow. I, I, so I don't, need to, uh, don't need to go through everything. Um, but the first three in particular saved us uh, either money or, or headache. Uh, number one is negotiate price prices to incent usage. Uh, cell phone companies do this backwards. They want you to they want to lock you in at the highest rate so they can charge you massive fees for overages. Uh, some of our vendors, in fact, almost all of our vendors, uh, have tried to do this. Uh, but if you turn it around at them, it actually works wonders. That you want to use their service more, but you want to make sure you get a, a cheaper usage. You know, as usage goes up, you want you want a cheaper rate. In particular, with our uh, like Akamai. Businesses, this becomes important. Uh, number two was prefer vendors with, with humility. So high energy sales guys uh, will say, you know, yes, 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 we can we can do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but vendors that are open and honest about their services, especially if they, they really give you some degree of their own problems. Like if they're saying there's absolutely nothing wrong, uh, that's a huge red signal that there's probably something massively wrong. <laughs> and then uh, this. Very important. Also, architecture architecture switching costs. Keep it in mind as you're as you're making decisions. 
Uh, if you go with a particular vendor and start customizing like crazy, you're like locked in. It's very difficult to get out of it, and they know that, and they will start charging you. They'll start charging you more. So you can think about things from your side in terms of how you're designing the architecture on your side of the, the fence to think about. Okay, we're going to build this with multiple vendors in mind. So you know, two years from now, a year from now, whenever you're re renegotiating this, uh, the switching cost, you've already taken that into account and can do it more seamlessly than you otherwise would. Uh, other things: immediately remove auto renew. Uh, Clauses, vendors love that. Uh, prefer short term over uh, over untested long term contracts. It's very tempting. You always get these big discounts for going going long term, but almost in every case I've done that, I've come to regret it because we find something better, new technology emerges, whatever it becomes uh, not worth it. Uh, focus on your needs. Uh, vendors uh, sure not to be difficult to uh, uphold and accept you as needs. The last one, I'll, I'll let you uh, read the rest. But the last one, uh, I just added uh, before I came over here, thinking about it some more, was SLA monitoring. This is one thing, it's a minor thing, but it's been a big time saver for me. For all of our major all of our major vendors, I have them report to us if they're meeting the benchmark. Like normally they, they put in all these you know, guarantees, uptime this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the only way you're ever gonna know if they're not meeting it is that you are, you know, if you, if you monitor, which you should do. Uh, but you put the onus on them that they have to send you automatic reports whenever something goes awry. Or for most of our vendors, on that report, uh, maybe maybe a weekly. It does make uh, makes my life much easier. So I think uh, I think that's it. Uh, happy to help you guys and uh, share it whatever I can. Thank you. I really um, respect and appreciate the approach you've been presenting of um, uh, trying to make things as fun as possible and give back. That creates a very positive, how it's beneficial to everyone. Um, what I'm trying to struggle, what I'm struggling with wrapping my mind around is how to balance that with when you're starting out on a very lean budget. Because I'm, you know, it's great to talk about Google doing this, but, you know, they're huge now. Um, and you guys are well established as well. How, how can you plan doing that from the very beginning? Or can you? The, uh, so, two thoughts. Uh, number one, you, you need oxygen in your business. So better me does come first. Like you have to make your business work. You have to start generating revenue and, and, and profits. Otherwise, you have little to share if you're so um, consumed with you know, paying the bills. That said, um, but even if it is declaring your intentions to do certain things and finding very small ways to do it, uh, it does make a difference. It makes, I found it makes a difference to my own, the people I'm, that I work with, my own, my own employees. It makes a difference to the partners that we have. Uh, because it, there's, in almost all instances, there's a way to help that's, even if it's just, uh, uh, Adam Grant wrote this book, uh, it, it was a uh, uh, New York Times recently. Uh, what's the name of it? Give and Take. Give and Take. So uh, thesis professor uh, at, at Penn, very popular. Uh, his whole thesis is like, the more you give, the more you're gonna get. So kind of the golden rule. Turbocharge, and the um, he has this concept of kind of the five minute give. Uh, even doing that has been super helpful for me. That in instances where I'm just like so worn out or I just don't have time, but someone's asking for help, I can always give five minutes of help. I can always you know refer them to somebody or give some tidbit or um, not do what I used to do, which is really kind of black and white. Either like you're in the circle and you're a friend and I'm going to help you, versus do nothing. Sure, I mean, it's all about leverage for negotiation, right? The, uh, so at a minimum, you need more than, you need to have, you need to have them play off, you need to play off each other. Uh, that's the most important part. Of course, having more volume gives you, gives you more, gives you more leverage, but the, uh, if you're only dealing with one vendor, there's, there's no way that's gonna be able to, uh, there's no way that's gonna be able to do that. And so you found that, what's your success rate with reversing? Uh, most of our hmm, success rate I know from, from a dollar's perspective, we've, in this year alone, for example, we, uh, we were using, um, I think Akamai, we switched to, is it Limelight? Uh, Limelight, um, which, I don't know, disclose, I don't know if it's open source or not, but the, um, that was part and parcel of, of 
of those discussions. We saved an enormous amount of money. I actually had the same experience in a previous business about Valor. Uh, we, uh, when we got beyond like uh, 1,000 customers with one of the companies, uh, with their residents for them, we negotiated like uh, about $3 on each customer, it's lower price for us. So um, the bigger volume you have, you have uh, more uh, power to negotiate better terms for your company. 